Hello and welcome to K1YPP's little lecture on how to go out there and backpack with a radio. First of all, what I'd like to talk about is some of the historical methods that we went out into the field with a radio. Way back in the 60s, the 1960s, I built a 6 meter radio with vacuum tubes it ran on batteries. The whole assembly probably weighed, let's say, 10 pounds. I found that for every hour of operating, I was typically using perhaps $12 worth of batteries in today's dollars. 12 bucks an hour. And it was a six meter radio, AM. Didn't have tremendous range, but it worked and I had a lot of fun with it. I was a lot younger then. In the 70s, I decided to get into a little more serious backpacking. I went off and got a Heathkit HW9. I had already had an HW7. I skipped over the HW8. And it was a kit. I built it. I used it occasionally for backpacking. Now the reason I say occasionally is it was heavy. You didn't go off on a three-month trip with an HW9. The, and it wasn't so much the radio. It was bulky and it was somewhat heavy. But the batteries, the batteries were massive. Here's a typical motorcycle battery that I was using at that time. This one weighs 14 pounds. Now, if you, if you plan on going out there backpacking, and you're going to carry a 14-pound battery and perhaps a 3, 4-pound, 5-pound radio, that doesn't leave much room for food, the sleeping equipment, the tent, and so on. It was really, really limited backpacking in QRP radio. I also, at that time, needed, had to have a key. I brought my brass racer with me. This thing weighs a couple of pounds. Altogether, this gear was just too heavy for long distance hiking. Hiking like you would do on the Appalachian Trail or the Camino in Spain. In 2007, I set off to do a hike of the Appalachian Trail. I didn't have a very small radio at that point, so I decided, being an electrical engineer, that I'd build one. And this, this was the fruits of my labor. It's a two-band radio. It's QRP, runs about a watt and a half or so. It's actually a fairly high-performance radio, even though it doesn't appear to be much. It was 80 meters and 40 meters. And I worked quite a few stations with this thing. It has a little homemade key on the front built right into it. I was pretty happy with it. It used eight AA batteries. And I was using these Energizer lithium batteries. It, they're not too bad. It, it would last fairly well. But it was bulky. It's a bit heavy. And a little awkward to pack and carry and keep it dry and so on. In 2007, when I returned, or I took a little hiatus from the trail for a six artery heart bypass. Steve Weber, KD1JV up in New Hampshire, took pity on me and said, Dennis, you can't possibly be hiking with all this weight. He said, this is why you're, you're having heart problems. And he sent me a ATS3 radio. The ATS-3 is a couple of generations old compared to what he's currently selling, but it's a fabulous radio. Here's the entire station that I carried on the Appalachian Trail in 2008. This wire, nice Teflon coated, very flexible wire, 
is the antenna. It's 51 feet long. This is the counterpoise wire that I throw on the ground and connect to the ground side of the radio. Now the counterpoise is not really a ground wire. A lot of people think that's the case. You have a ground wire and an antenna. And I'll explain shortly why that's not the case. And I carry some spare wire. And a roll of string to throw the wire up into the tree. I usually use a water bottle about a third full. And that makes a really nice tossing device. Here's some of the cables that I use to connect the radio. And this is a little White Rook paddle. It's made by White Rook. I think they're out in California. Nice little device. I can hold it on my lap. Key away. Now sometimes on the trail, if I'm really trying to cut down on weight, I carry a pair of these little earbud things. I think these are Sony here. And they work quite well, but I find that over time, my ears get sore. They're sort of stuck in your ear, and even though they have the little hanger. So what I prefer to do, even especially on the long hikes, I carry a pair of nice little stereo headphones. They come with CD players and so on. They're padded, much more comfortable. If you're going to be on the air for a number of hours, these are the babies you want to have, would you? More cables. Still not wireless. Here, here's the, this much abused and used ATS3 radio. Now this radio is in an Altoids tin can, or in this case, it's somebody else, Hershey's tin. It's the same size as Altoids. The radio itself is very tiny. It's got plug-in modules for different bands. This particular model runs 80, 40, 30, and 20 meters. And I've found out there on the trail it's about the only bands I need. In fact, I find almost all of my operation on 40 meters, some on 30 meters, and sometimes on 20 meters. Your mileage may vary. I carry, I carry an antenna tuner. This one is actually a kit from qrpme.com, QRP Maine. It's a wonderful tuner. This tuner will match just about anything, I think, including wet noodles. You plug the rig into one side, you throw the antenna on the other side, and you should be able to match it with this thing. Now, I'm going to comment a little bit more about the antenna. You see, I carry, over the years, any number of antennas. I've had dipoles. I've had off-center fed windows. I've had verticals. If you can think of an antenna that fits the portable category, I've probably tried it. And I've come down to the conclusion that there's two optimum antennas for QRP backpacking. The first is, if you're going to operate single band, let's say just 40 meters, in fact, 40 is a special case, but if you're going to operate 40 meters, I would carry two resonant wires. I think it's about 33 feet for a 40 meter antenna. And I would take one of those 33 foot wires, throw it up in a tree, take the other 33 foot wire, and you can either also throw it up in another tree somewhere else and make a V antenna, or you can just take one leg of it, the ground side of your rig, and lay it on the ground if there's nothing convenient. That works like gangbusters. The big advantage is that there's no transmission line. There's no coax. You actually put the antenna, the 33 feet up into the tree, put it right into the antenna connector. No, no coax, no losses, nothing. You don't even need a tuner. I did that in 2007. It was very effective. 
The other antenna configuration that I really favor these days, if you're going multi-band, is what I described earlier with 51 feet of wire and a random length of wire. And what you do is, and I'll have to show you here a model diagram of what it really looks like, but you have the 51 foot wire, and then you have the radio itself, and then you have a counterpoise wire. The counterpoise wire will vary in length, depending on the band you're using. And what you'll do with that counterpoise wire is essentially create an off-center fed window, where the radio is actually right in the antenna. You don't have any coaxial feeders, you don't have any losses with feed line. This antenna is extremely efficient, extremely light, very easy to use, but it needs a tuner to match the 50 ohms of the transmitter to whatever that crazy configuration ends up being. You find on occasion that you have to play with the counterpoise length depending on the band you're on, but once you figure out what approximately works, it's a go. Now the other issue, going back to my days with the HW9, for example, is the power for the radio station. And here's why I've settled on the ATS-3. There's some other really good radios out there these, these days. The KX-1, the KX-3 with Electcraft, one of my favorites. It's small, it's light, low battery consumption. You absolutely cannot carry lots of heavy batteries. And this is where this new modern equipment, Steve Weber's things, the KX-1, the KX-3, they, they sip the battery power. They're very, very efficient. Now, in the case of the ATS-3, what I did is I homebrewed another mint tin. I homebrewed a battery pack. It has six Energizer lithium batteries in there. Now, why the lithiums? Two reasons. First of all, the power lasts absolutely forever. And secondly, they're cost-wise, if you look at the actual amount of operating time you get out of them, they're less expensive than almost anything else out there. They're a little expensive to buy up front, but they last eight, nine times as long as standard alkalines. You can't beat that. Now what I did here is I just have some little PC board stuck in the sides with some foam behind it, and I just put the batteries in series. Six of them is enough power for the ATS-3. In the case of the KX1s, KX3s, you probably have to go to a few more of these. Now, for those of you who read amateur journals like QST and CQ magazine, you may recall that last June of 2014, I actually had an article in CQ magazine. You might check that out. It covers pretty much what I've talked about today. It covers QRP from the early beginnings where I was actually involved in carrying gasoline power generators up mountains just so we could get on the air. Those days are gone, thank goodness, at least physically carrying them up. I went out to hike the Appalachian Trail in 2007. I ended up having heart surgery, got off the trail, took 300 days to recover. Now, when hikers refer to a day off from the trail, that's called a zero day. Simply put, because you're doing zero miles. Now, in my case, I had the heart surgery. I ended up with 300 zero days. I wrote a book about it called 300 Zeros, spelled out. And in 300 Zeros, I talk about the hike, of course, the heart surgery, and I put just enough amateur radio in this book to make it a general populist read, a read that just about anyone would enjoy. It covers hiking, it covers amateur radio on the trail. It's a humorous take on what it is to spend six months out in the woods. 
Check it out on 300zeros.com. It's also available on most of the electronic readers like Kindles and Nooks, as well as in print on Amazon.com. Thank you.